All right, this is where we where I usually introduce people, but today, welcome everyone. We are presenting the 1950 census, understanding, finding and utilizing, and I, Sue Kaufman, am doing the presentation. So I will read a little of my biography. I have 35 years experience as a genealogy librarian, and um, I've been the manager of the Houston Public Library Clayton Library Center since for genealogical research since 2006. I started my uh, career in Illinois, where I'm from, at the Peoria, Illinois Public Library. And then after that, I moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I worked at the Allen County Public Library in the Genealogy Center, which houses the largest genealogy collection in the country outside of the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. I received my master's degree from Dominican University in Chicago, Illinois. Throughout the years, I've been a lecturer at local, state, and national conferences. Uh, for many years, I've also been on board positions uh, in Illinois, Indiana, and Texas. I am currently the Director of Education for the Texas State Genealogy Society, and I am a past president of the Texas State Genealogical Society. In 2019, uh, I was awarded the National Genealogical Society ProQuest P. William Philby Genealogical Librarianship Award. I became a fellow of the Texas State Genealogical Society and also in 2019 I was awarded by the Dallas Genealogical Society the Lloyd DeWitt Bockstruck Outstanding Service Award. So I hope that you enjoy my presentation today and let's get started. We're going to talk about the 1950 census, which was one of the biggest events in the genealogical community in I mean, aside from your own personal research that you might have those big genealogical events in the last year. I am going to turn off my camera and going to get started. So the 1950 census is something um, when the 1940 census came out 10 years ago, we called it the census that you could touch. The 1950 census, maybe a, num a lot of us are in the 1950 census, or in fact, it is even a little more personable because the people that we are seeing in the 1950 census, as in my case, I can remember stories. And these people really have come alive uh, in seeing the 1950 census. So what we're going to do is I'm, we are going to begin by understanding the 1950 census. We are going to do a little census background. So I think many of us know that the census is for the apportioning of seat in the House of Representatives. Um, redistricting comes along, but the counting of people really was how many representatives is each state going to have in Congress? We also need to remember that questions are driven by information and the data collection was the need of the federal government at the time. It wasn't about doing uh, genealogical research. It was for social history. Remember, when did you immigrate? Where were you born? Even in the 1940 census, did you own, or the 1930 census, did you own a radio? So those kind of questions really, and the purpose behind the census is social statistics. And these censuses throughout the year evolved and reflect the change in social reality and the social context. And the census is the basic building block for your research. It is a 10 year snapshot and a lot of happens in 10 years, but it is the basic building block where you should most often start with your research. And of course, when we begin our research, we start backwards with ourselves from the most recent and we work backwards. So we can begin now in the 1950 census and work backwards. Another thing when I mentioned the apportioning for the House of Representatives, um, there was this ad that was placed by some of us might remember the ad council and the ad council that came on the TV and had all these different ads uh, for things. But when the 1950 census came out, people, you know, there was a push in advertising to fill out the 1950 census because of the apportionment for uh, representatives, but then also funding from the federal government. So this was an ad, as I mentioned, in 1950 about what happened in the 1940 census and because people answered the 1940 census. This area got money for playground. They got money for um, other things that the children needed. 
and for the community. And so this was, like I said, an ad for to remind people too when the census began in 1950 on April 1st, give them a straightforward, honest answer. That's the way you can help make this community of ours a better place to live in. So there was a lot involved in taking the census. For all those of us that have been doing family history research for a while, we see and we're familiar with these censuses. In 1790 to 1840, the beginning of the early days of the census, we uh, got the head of the household and the age and the gender of those living there. No names of those living there. And these are useful yet cumbersome and not as easy to use because of course it's not giving everybody's name, but we can use them if we start to evaluate the names and the, the numbers. However, thank goodness in 1850, they started collection of names of everyone in the house. And throughout those years from 1850 to 1940, of course, questions were different. Some were the same throughout the censuses. Obviously, the name of the person in the relationship to the head of the household. But age came in at a certain point where they were living were a certain point. Remember 1870, formerly enslaved people were listed for the first time. And remember in this time period, the 1890 census was burned in a fire in Washington. So there have been some challenges, but again, you can see you begin to be to create a family when you start looking at the censuses. So what about 1950? 1950, what's new in 1950? 1950 was the first census to use the computer to input results. And they used um, uh, OCRing, I mean, uh, opt optical, I'm sorry, that's a, a misspelling, it should be OCRing, to curate and to index. So they did go ahead and try and use some of that input and try and create those indexes. And it's the last census where a person physically walked to each house. 1960, they did mailing and walking, but 1950 was the last year that everybody went out and canvassed the areas. And additionally, um, we know that there were supplemental questions in the 1940 census, and it was, I think, every 14 people, but one in five people, so on the fifth line, every single person was asked supplemental questions. So I know you can't read that sheet. So here, here are questions asked on the form of population and housing. And we can see, and if you, again, remember I talked about social history and statistics. If you look at some of the questions that all people answered, where they were living, did you own a ranch? Did you own a farm? How many three or more acres? Uh, the relationship to the head of the household, marital status, naturalization status. If the person that they were talking to was over 14 years of age, you can see they wanted to know about work. They wanted to know about occupation. And then there were sample lines, and we'll see those a little closer in a little while. There were questions for persons on these sample lines. Were they living in the same house a year ago? What's the highest grade? So there were some school questions, um, some questions about what, where their parents were born. So not only are these, this is a lot of information that we're looking for and a lot of statistics that can be drawn, but remember also, there's plenty of opportunity for incomplete or wrong information, as there is with everything that we use. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt. We do not know who answered the questions in the 1950 census. Remember, in the 1940 census, we know who answered the questions because on those censuses, you'll see a little circle with an X in it, and that's the person who gave the information, but that's only 1940. There is no indication on the 1950 census of who gave the information. Here's a couple other things to think about with the 1950 census. Military bases that were not on United States sto soil, the enumerations were destroyed. So if you have a military base in a foreign country, not in a territory, but in a foreign country, the enumerations don't exist any longer. I mentioned the additional questions. Uh, also, the 1950 census, also, as I just mentioned, it enumerates the U.S. territories, and you can see those there. And then also, 
initially indexed by artificial intelligence, and then we're carrying on using human authentication. So one of the most important things, if there was a military base like in the Panama Canal Zone, you will find those enumerated because it was a territory, Alaska, Hawaii, the others also. But again, not on U.S. soil, the enumerations um, were destroyed. So let's talk a little bit more about the 1950 census and some of the things that we can find that are interesting because remember, we do family history and it's very nice to look at names on a census sheet or it's very nice to look at names on a pedigreed chart but those people had lives those people lived in society and so you can weave a family history story by adding social history in addition to the documents that we're finding in 1950 on the census. Family search, in addition to ancestry, but family search has some great things and some great ideas for helping you uh, create a story around the 1950 census. So when you go to family search, there's a big banner across the top that says 1950 census. You click on that and down on that page, there are historical events that surround 1950. So of course you can look at this and you begin to weave the story. Was your individual that's in the 1950 census in World War II? Are there stories about that? Was the individual that you're looking at in 1950 um, part of maybe the Korean War or the Vietnam War. The invention of the microwave happened in 1950. You can go out to Google and put in events in 1950 and find all kinds of things that will help you weave your family story. In addition to that, when you scroll down on the 1950 census, you'll see that you can find some information, I mean, um, on family search, you'll see that you can find some information about housing. One of the interesting things about housing is, is in the 1950 census, you'll, they, note, they note that there, that's the beginning of suburbanization moving out of the city into the suburbs. And in 1960, it's very apparent. Um, they get graduating, I mean, uh, collecting information about race and sex, education, military service. There were 99% of males in this serving abroad. Serving abroad was 0.83% and you can see the other statistics. So, of those 300,000, you'll see the statistics there. Again, your ancestor or your family, your father, your mother, might have been one of those females in the war serving abroad. So there's part of a story. And uh, as I mentioned, that a lot of the families were moving out into the suburbs and we can see the amount of people that were living rural, living in a farm and living in an urban area at this time. And of course, occupation, we see that there was the average was $3,300 a year of salary. And we can see that the family income in 2020 commensurately was $67,000. We can see that 72% of the working class was male, where 28% is, where now it's basically half and half. So these are the kinds of things not only can you weave your family story with, but you can do intergenerational discussions and showing, um, you know, younger people when you click on one of these circles, information comes up and that begins a dialogue, which then, of course, begins passing on the family story, which is why we are trying to do family history. In 1950, the leaf blower was invented. Next time you take your you go do your lawn and you take your grandchild out, tell them that the leaf blower was was invented now 72 years ago. The Tennessee Waltz was a popular music and you can see these other things. Cost of the first stamp was three cents. Movie ticket was 55 cents and here's sports. The Cleveland Browns defeated the Los Angeles Rams in the football and the NFL and the New York Yankees defeated and won the World Series. And you can see Cinderella was the most interesting, was a top grossing film. All this is about creating the family history and what happened in the 1950 census when you discover those names. So I talked a little bit about 
well, maybe I haven't mentioned enumeration districts. So enumerators and enumeration districts. The enumeration district is an area that can be canvassed by a single individual. I mentioned how we still how they still walked the areas in 1950 in a census period. And if you don't know the enumeration district, sometimes, as with mine in Chicago, you could be browsing a huge number of pages because the census is not fully indexed now. So the enum yet it's going to be about another four or five months for it to be fully indexed. The artificial intelligence ran through it, and we have been trying to help that artificial intelligence by adding names. But the address right now is really the key to finding people. And with that address, you get the enumeration district. And the enumeration district and the enumerator instructions are important, and I'll show you why in a second. And there is a website, and it's also in your handout, to help you find those enumeration district numbers. stevemorse.org, it's on your handout. One of the basic ways to do it is to find the address in 1940 census, or try and find a phone book, or a city directory, or a document near 1950 that's going to give you the address because like I said, the address is the key to getting the enumeration district. All right, so let's just talk about the instructions for enumerators for a second because this is an answer to a question to the to the question of why did the enumerator do it answer the write down this information that way or why is this information like this, or what does this information mean? So, and on the, this is the National Archives website. It is in your handout, and here's where you can actually get copies of the enumerator's reference manual. It is digitized, and it is interesting reading, um, especially when you have a, a, a certain issue. And you can see how the enumerator walked through the area and it gets you an idea knowing that there was not, they just didn't go up one street and down another street. They had a path and they had assigned areas. So reading the enumerator's manual can really help. As an example, this happens to be the 1950 census for my father in New, in New York. My father was born in New York and my father was living in New York. Here we see my father's father, Emil, my grandmother, Helen, and my uncle, Carl. But if you notice, there is another name, Rothman, under there, and you notice Howard, and Howard is crossed out. And when I saw that, I wondered why my father was crossed out. And then I remembered it was 1950 and dad was at Purdue University in Tippecanoe County, Indiana. And so then I then looked further. I went for, I had used the National Archives, the artificial intelligence, and I was getting some false hits. And then I just decided to go to Tippecanoe County in Indiana. And I did find my father and you find my father there, the Howard R. Kaufman, who is a lodger, and you can see that it's the men's residence hall. So he was crossed out because, and I'll show you in a second, the enumerator instructions told them to do that. But the information, the questions that they asked, we can see that my father was 19, that he was born in New York. It says um, he was not employed, he wasn't working, and he didn't make any money. He was in college. In the enumerator instructions, members of the household attending a school below the college level and residing in other EDs should be uh, below the college level should be enumerated with their family. Student nurses and students at the college level will be enumerated in the enumeration district in which they are living while attending school. So had I not realized that or remembered that my father might have been in Tippecanoe County and I saw that he was crossed out in the New York side, I could have come to the enumerator's instructions and found out why he was crossed out, indicating that he shouldn't be enumerated there. And then that would have been a clue that, oh yeah, he was in college. 
and he was in Tippecanoe because he was he was 19 years old. So again, you're evaluating the situation and trying to come up with an answer where someone is or what kind of documents you can find. Let's talk about finding the 1950 census now. OK, we know that we have to look in by address and I'll show you how to do that in a little while. But what we're going to talk about now is where actually is the 1950 census? Where can I browse it? Where does it live right now? I'll tell you right now it doesn't live at Family Search. What Family Search role is is to help uh, gather the indexers and the projects to index the overview, the overall census. <clears throat> so the A, the artificial intelligence went in and indexed it. We as a genealogical community are reviewing what the artificial intelligence do, did, has done. Family Search has a blog and also through that 1950 link on Family Search, there is a page that will continually be updated for the percentage that has been reviewed and therefore indexed. And you can find out on Ancestry which states are fully indexed, but this is sort of a chart to see where's what's going on. You can see that it's actually Nevada that this is uh, a couple days ago that Nevada is the one that is fully indexed. Uh, they're working on other ones. So here we have if you are so inclined and you might recognize names, especially where you're from. I can recognize Polish names because I'm from Chicago, so I can get started. You can pick the area that you're interested in. You can review the headers. You can review names and help get that census indexed out. So to find the actual census. NARA released the, uh, the census of the National Archives and Records Administration released the census on April 1st. I think that there might be many of us that were sitting there uh, on March, three days has September, March 31st at midnight waiting for April 1st. I know that we worked with the Clayton, I was with the Clayton Library friends. We had about 35 of us on a Zoom meeting and when the national, when at midnight, we all started searching, we all started sharing and there were people who were searching until three o'clock in the morning. I think I left maybe, oh, it was 11 o'clock central time, midnight uh, Eastern time. I think I left maybe about one o'clock. But every 72 years they release it at the National Archives. You can see that there's a link there. So the census is there and there are search strategies available at the National Archives to help you search that artificial intelligence index and then also a way to browse. MyHeritage is another database that you can access with a Houston Public Library card from home or in house at the library. They also have the 1950 census and we can see that there is a full index for other states. So you need to keep going back to MyHeritage. You need to keep going back to Family Search and Ancestry to see as these indexes are produced, which state is done. So MyHeritage has it, the National Archives and Ancestry of course has it. So Ancestry has the 1950 census and in fact they have a direct link to the 1950 census district finder so you don't have to go to Steve Morse directly you can go to Ancestry either here at the library or a personal subscription and you can see that they also are offering getting notified when your state is indexed you can start looking for free if you do not have a subscription to Ancestry you still can look at the 1950 census for free and then, of course, there are ways to help you find uh, and utilize the census more effectively. You can see that there are links here to learn more about that. There's a link to details of the decade to help you. This is all on Ancestry farther down on the web page. Uh, you can learn a little history about who wrote the code for the computer age. And again, filling in your family story. Here, just for fun, is a flashback to 1950. Again, an interactive part of fam of ancestry, excuse me. And we can see that a gallon of gas was 27 cents in 1950, 420 today, loaf of bread, see the difference. Can of tomato soup, a hotel room, a new car. Not the cars I'm looking at. <laughs> but so, um, again, 
the census is available through the National Archives, through Ancestry for free, through my heritage, either inside the library here um, or with your Houston Public Library card remotely. So those are where the censuses are. And then again, as each census, each state is indexed, going back to those places that hold them, finding out what's indexed um, will help you get into it. So let's talk about utilizing the census. Um, we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, finding uh, famous people and finding famous people are interesting because again, these were people that might have made an impression on your family or you. Elvis Presley, he was 15, knowing uh, the future. Albert Einstein, Roberto Clemente. There is an opportunity to teach or learn social history, even for ourselves or teaching little ones about the social history. And so that's what's really cool about the 1950 census, because although it was 72 years ago, I'm not that far away from 72, really 10 years, I guess. And uh, it really is part of our lives and therefore it should be part of our descendants lives. So let's do some actual searching so we can see uh, how to maybe get into it. We're going to do urban searching. We are going to search my family in Chicago, Cook County, Illinois. From the 1940 census, I can see that my mother was born in 1935 and I look at the 1940 census. I find that she's in Ward 46, Chicago, Cook County. I click on that and then I get the 1940 census sheet. One of the things that is important to look at, and this is why 1940 is very important. See, here is the street name, Addison. Here is, this is my family here. This is my grandfather, my grandmother, and my mother. This is the address, 620 Addison. You can see that there's a lot of 620, so it was an apartment building. All right, the next question is, where are they living in 1950? What is going to give me the answer to my question? Could be a city directory, could be a phone book, could be a document that's going to get me as close as I possibly can to 1950. Well, since I am in an urban area, I decide that I'm going to try and look for the Chicago city directories. Well, I had forgotten because I knew this, but I had forgotten that the Chicago city directories stopped being published in 1928. For whatever reason. Not every state is like that, not every city is like that, but Chicago being so big, I can remember the 1928 book had to be four or five inches thick. So then, okay, how am I going to try and find their address? So I say, okay, I'll look in a phone book. So I go out to Google and I put in Chicago telephone books and up comes the Library of Congress US telephone directory collection and I drill down to Chicago and I drill down to the time period and lo and behold I happen to find my grandfather Irving. I also found my uncle Harry the doctor, but I found my grandfather Irving. Harry was his brother. That's why they're together with the Krauts at 620 Addison. They're at the same address. And I know that many of you might be looking at the phone numbers. Remember when the phone numbers were like that? I can remember that was my grandmother's phone number. My grandmother died in 2001, and my grandmother had that phone number until 2001. 248 8794. I can still remember it. So there's a story. There's a story. There's a family story. You could find these phone numbers and tell about the phone number just like I did. Take that address. This is from the phone directory. This is what the Steve Morse website looks like. Scroll on down. You'll find the 1940 to 1950 enumeration district map link. And this is where the address, the state and the city are very important because you will continually put in the cross streets that you find to narrow down the enumeration districts because Chicago has 500, no, 5,055 enumeration districts. 
I needed the address. Step. I put in Illinois, Cook County, Chicago, house number 620, Addison West. I got the enumeration district map. See, there's a link there that says CED maps for Cook County. I also want you to notice the cross streets, Pine Grove, Broadway, Patterson, and then you'll see down there where it says 1950 ED numbers, you'll see that there are two enumeration districts. When you add those cross streets, it narrows down the enumeration districts. So remember what that looks like. I put in Chicago, Cook County. I got the 5,055 enumeration districts. I put all this stuff in. It says CED maps for Cook County. This is what the enumeration district map looks like. I blew it up, so it's kind of fuzzy. But that link took me to these enumeration district maps. This is Chicago and I blew this up because I wanted you to see how many enumeration districts were just in each block. Each block because of so many people was an enumeration district in itself. Those round numbers, the enumeration district are the orange numbers. Those round numbers you can see over on the right just so happens to be a map of Cook County. And that is the key to which map you can hone in on by the enumeration district. So I ascertained that because I knew where kind of the family was in Cook County, I ascertained that the map, my map that I was looking at had to be six or seven. But the original, the page actually looks like this. I just blew up map one. I went to map six that I got from that key that was over in the right hand that showed me Cook County. And in fact, you can see that that is Addison Street. The angled street is Broadway. The street on the top where it says 444 is Patterson. And actually the street on the right is Pine Grove. So I know now that I should be looking in enumeration district 4444. Went to Ancestry. Ancestry is not completely indexed for Illinois. Il Illinois, nothing. Illinois is 12%, I think I read on Family Search. So I searched, I put in my mother's name, I put in my grandfather's name, I put in my grandmother's name, I put information. Nothing ever came up. So then what I did was is over on the right hand side of the 1950 uh, web page is browse this collection. So I narrowed it down to Illinois, I went to Cook, I went to Chicago, and all those enumeration districts are listed. 103 is the county number. Each county in every state is given a number. Cook County is 103. The enumeration district is 4444. And we can see the boundaries bounded by Patterson, by Pine Grove, by Addison, by Broadway. Does not include Pine Lodge Hotel. However, those are the streets that I needed. And as I browsed, lo and behold, there was my grandfather Irving, my grandmother Ida, and my mother Elaine. One of the things I've noticed that was interesting that I did not know, Lena. Lena is my grandmother's stepmother. I did not know that they were living in the same apartment building. Also, it's kind of hard to see, but if you look right here, my grandfather was that actually if I if you pull it out on the census, my grandfather was a census enumerator, did not do this sheet, but was a census enumerator and he got paid $71. My grandmother was a salesperson and my Aunt Lena was there. See, Addison 620, they were still living there in the apartment building. The other thing I want you to notice is see where it says no one home. See sheet 79 or 78 lines 15 and 16. If people were not at home, the enumerator was instructed to go back and add those people at the end of that enumeration district. Usually starts on sheet 78. Sometimes you'll see sheet 721, but the people that were not home are at the end of that enumeration district. 
one of the other things is, is that this was a Jewish community. April 1st, a night in 1950 was the first night of Passover. So you why these people might not have answered the door is because of Passover. So you have to again begin looking at this in a very large Jewish community and they're not answering the door. Maybe they were celebrating, maybe they weren't, but you'll find them at the end of the census. Also note that here my grandmother. These are the indicators of the supplemental questions. Here are my grandmother's answers to the supplemental questions. Now, interestingly, I'll tell you in a second. So she was okay living in this same house a year ago. She wasn't living on a farm. She was living in this country a year ago. She was living in Cook County in Illinois. Now it says, what country were his father and mother born in? My mother, my grandmother, Ida, her parents were born in Russia. I know that because I have naturalization papers um, for the two of them, and they were born in Russia. So they came from England. My grandmother was born in New York. She had two siblings that were born in England. But again, we don't know who gave the information. So. Again, taking everything with a grain of salt. My grandmother went through grades through grade 12. She finished 12. She didn't attend school. She made $2,400 last year. She worked 52 in 1950. She worked 52 weeks. She worked every week. She used to work at Marshall Fields, which is now Macy's, of course. One of the other things that you can do is, is I actually looked at a current Google map to get the cross streets also. So I took that address into Google and I put it out there just to get a picture of the area. So there's 620 Addison and I circled Lakeshore Drive because my grandmother after um, my grandfather died in 1962 and after 1962 my grandmother if not before moved to 3600 Lakeshore Drive to this condo and she lived there probably till a couple of years before she died and she still moved in the neighborhood but also notice remember we talked about people that weren't there also notice that there's Temple Sholem which is a Jewish temple, obviously, so we're in a Jewish neighborhood. And then also I happen to take at Google, you can get a regular picture of what the place look like, looks like now. So there's a family history story. And you can do this too for your family and you can pass this on. So let's quickly look at a rural searching. We're doing Ford County, Illinois, which is central Illinois. Um, we're looking at the Taverner family. And we are looking at a Robert Taverner in 1940 who was living in Patton, Patton Township in Ford County, Illinois. Robert Taverner married Dorothy Mildred Parsons in 1946. Uh, the last address that I had was Patton. You can see that they're now in Paxton which is the city in Illinois. That's another address because I found a marriage so it's getting me closer to 1950 went back to the Steve Morse site. I put in Illinois Ford County. Uh, 27 enumeration districts, knowing that it is a rural county, a very rural county. I just went to the one enumeration district map that exists. This is Ford County. It's an odd shaped county, but notice in the upper right hand corner, like the map for Cook County, there's some information here where it says see detailed maps for the cities in Ford County. We see Paxton is one of them. I honed in on Paxton itself and we can see that it is in Paxton is County 27, enumeration district 15 or 18. Go back to ancestry, go back to browse and pull up the census and you'll do the same thing as I did for Cook County and then find them. So that's an example of doing rural and urban searching. So one to, to close out, one of the most important things is learning is the key to effective researching. So on your handout, the National Archives, 
um, has done some videos. There's some Ancestry's done some YouTube videos, so you can learn and get some more deeper information about searching. There's uh, plenty of other things that you can read. Roots Tech has some videos on doing the 1950 census, and then of course giving back, you can go in and do that indexing, which might be kind of interesting because you might come across some things that you didn't know, like my great grandmother Lena. So that was interesting to me. One of the other things um, to wrap this up and to really make it a, a family history, um, what I did here was is I actually took the Tippecanoe County information for my father while he was at Purdue. I found a Purdue yearbook, which actually is from 1953, I think, 52 or 53, and I copied that out of it and I actually this is just a, a PowerPoint slide, but I put it on a frame. And um, we had Maureen Taylor, uh, the photo detective, do a presentation for us. Um, I don't know, a couple a month ago or actually April 1st. It was April 1st. It was the day after the census was released. And we were talking since she's the photo detective, we were talking about that. And so I put this together as a picture. Wouldn't this be a nice gift or something like that with an with a 1950 census? And that's just really cool. So I just wanted to give you some ideas about writing sources, writing, uh, writing uh, your family history, some ideas that you know, are kind of modern and a present to give. And I do hope that at this point you are now ready to research and you can go out and hunt and put your family in social context and pass those stories on to our descendants. So I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. I am going to turn back on my Compute on my camera and we'll throw it back to Mitch once I can figure out how to get my. Oh, here it is. Throw it back to Mitch. Mitch, are there any questions? I think everybody was really enthralled by your presentation today. Uh, hopefully, some more questions come in. Uh, Andrew brings up a, a, a question that I hadn't really considered that you might be able to shed some light on as did do other countries in the world uh, do a census? We don't, or are the, we the only one? Well, Mexico has a census. Canada has a census. Um, England took a census. I think they still do. Not necessarily on the zero years. I know that Mexico, uh, some of them are available, some of them aren't on the mm -hmm. on the one years. Mitch, do you know of any more? I mean, those are some questions that those are some countries that I could think of. Uh, you, yeah, Mexico is right. I've used the Mexican. Mm -hmm. Uh, census, I believe they do theirs on the uh, the 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 ten year mark as well as like like mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. But you're right, England has done theirs on the on the one year mark, and I I think of yeah several European countries I know of mm -hmm. do them. So, somebody just put in the chat that Ireland does it on the one year also. So yeah, that's not surprising. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not surprised that there aren't very many questions. I mean, I really this presentation honestly is about an a, a overview of the census, where you can find it and how to utilize it. And now mm -hmm. really it's just a matter of going out to uh, to use it. So. I, I saw a question that because uh, they're popping up for me too. the Mexico census, the census for Mexico is on family search, but I believe it's only 1931. Right, you're right. That's the only one that is available. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mm so. And it does require that you um, translate a little bit because obviously it's going to be in uh, in Spanish. Yes, which is why I have not gone over the pond back to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, let's just be serious here. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Yep. But we had, you know, we had um, well, a couple weeks ago when we had the German, do the uh, deciphering German documents with Dr. Fritz Euling, you know, learning just those keywords can be helpful too. So. All oh, right, I, I have done that. Uh, I didn't get to see that that one, but mm -hmm. I have, uh, I do have German ancestors and learning uh, the various uh, uh, meanings of German words is very important. To right, doing right. research and it opens up a lot of documents that 
are oh, <laughs> indecipherable almost uh, until you learn yeah. that and learning factor. Yeah. Yes. So anything else in there? I'm not seeing any other questions. Okay. Everybody. Uh, I, I think uh, everybody went back to um, well, here, here's here's a question from Joyce. They, they went back to searching the, the census. Exactly. Joyce uh, ask uh, ask, can you describe what the volunteer indexing task is like? Have you been able to do any of that? Well, what I've done is 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 the volunteer indexing task is where um, you can pick where you want to go and then you know by state or by and by county, and mm -hmm. then um, records are presented to you through family search and then you would mm -hmm. type in um you know what you are seeing and then that on top of it is also authenticated by another human have you done any indexing mitch at all not on this one i have not i had mm -hmm. done it before in the past i had not had a chance to work on this one um mm -hmm. something I, I something i can ask you about that is is indexing something that you can do on your own time or do you have to do it at certain hours do you know own time own time. So when you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, you can wake up and go back to sleep. No, <laughs> you can do indexing on your own time. Yes. Oh, yes. OK. Well, that's very useful. That's very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anytime you could do mm. it while you're watching TV. Yeah. And uh, not only not only the 1950 census, honestly, at Family Search, there's a whole indexing session a section. So if you have an expertise in a language, Mm -hmm. or an interest in something, you can look across the top on Family Search. There happens to be a link to indexing to begin with. So, uh, you know, that's very helpful because there's plenty of records out there on Family Search and other places that are not indexed. So, we are getting some some questions from people about where the uh, the recording is going to be posted and where the handouts are are going to be. And I'm putting that back into the uh, chat window right now. The, um, the quickest answer is that it will be posted to YouTube. It is being recorded. It'll be posted to the YouTube channel. I put a link in there in the chat to be able to find that playlist. It's the uh, HPL History Research Center's playlist that you will find all of our CPL uh, uh, goodness. And uh, I just put the links in for the program handout and the staff pick that goes along with it, some some added uh, uh, reading and uh, resources to go along with today's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, just looking at uh, some stuff coming in, uh, Mel says that transcription indexing is quite easy. Uh, I, I I have to agree with that. If you've done it, if you've read any records for yourself, it's the same thing. Basically, you're just writing it down for somebody else. Um, it is something that uh, worth giving a try. Um, Mary uh, Hollis uh, comments says, I like how you add in and, and incorporate ideas for the family social history and family stories. I, I do good. know that. Yeah, I do know that with you. That is important uh, with you, <laughs> yeah. Sue. The the getting a story out of out of a document instead of just a, a facts. You you know, there's just finding the story that's behind it. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's that's really important. Yeah, I mean, because really a pedigree chart, I think that all of us on this call have presented a pedigree chart to somebody and somebody could run. OK, because it's just mm -hmm. it's just not interesting. It's just not interesting. And so mm -hmm. that's really building that story. And Mitch, I also wanted to about the handout. Uh, we sent out an email maybe about uh, between 11 and noon, maybe uh, that has those links also to everybody that was registered. So you might be able to get the handout that way also. So check your spam. Just in check case. your spam filter. If you didn't get it in your email, you right. should there should be a, it should be a, in, in your email list. Right. Um, Robin says that on family search that uh, Robin searched for family members first and was uh, excited to correct the spelling. So I guess the first mm -hmm. one to find uh, the family member gets to correct the spelling <laughs> yeah. uh, for yeah. for future people. Uh, Robin says otherwise uh, I've enjoyed working on Texas and Louisiana. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, thank goodness for the artificial intelligence. Um, Ancestry put some stuff together and then shared it with, uh, you know, the National Archives and things like that. So it is interesting to see what the AI can do, um, uh, you it, know, so. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. seems like this one, this census has been a, a lot more accessible early than the 1940 was. 
because the 1940 it did require us to wait for human beings to go through and and index it whereas this one with the ai it did help a little bit uh, there were mm -hmm. some there were some misses but but uh, overall i think it was pretty successful and, and i i can't imagine what they're going to do in uh, in 10 years for the 1960 census Right. The the other thing that was interesting, remember, too, aside from I mean, the AI, yes, has been inordinately helpful. And the other thing is, is that there was the address in the 1940 census, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we could just, you know, if we were lucky, they were still living there. We could just pull over, you know, and not have to to. But 1940, yeah, it was it was a little more difficult to browse, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Because we really wouldn't have known where they were living, you know, unless you did a lot of that research too. But with 1950, you can just pull it over. But and right. the AI did help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the the last few census before this, you had to really dig into the enumeration district maps to find anything. Yeah, this is the I was when this came out. This is, and I think a lot of us that are on this call can remember. This is the fourth census that's come out since I've been a genealogy librarian. Um, so it's always been very exciting mm -hmm. um, to to do that. You know, before we and, and in 1930, I think was the first one to not. No, we have 30 upstairs on microfilm. So 1940 mm -hmm. was the one that was not released on microfilm. Right. So you know, we had to wait. You know, at least if, or I suppose we had to wait if people bought the microfilm, but. It was, but still, the digitization is is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't have any other okay. questions. Well, uh, I think we'll we'll maybe wrap right. it up for today. All right. So let's see. So let's let's get back over here for a second. And for those of you that are interested in coming to see us and talking to us and. You know, getting I had somebody call today about finding the 1950 census. I explained it to her, but by all means, you are more than welcome to come down and we will sit with you and discover your discoveries with you and get excited. These are our hours 10 to 5, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, and Thursdays are noon to 7. And if you have a question or need a presentation, by all means, here is our phone number. Feel free to call us, even if you're not in Texas, we'll talk and, and help you out. That's what we're here for. And of course you can, uh, with uh, we do some reference work. Usually we would like an exact question or an exact something that you need copies from. Uh, so if you just need to banter back and forth, probably a phone call is the best thing. And we are more than happy to talk to you and that's what we're here for. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining Mitch. I'd like to thank you for being here with us and, and producing this and thank all of you for again joining us. Have a great weekend and remember always cite your sources. Thanks everybody. <laughs>